Each year, visitors come to this country in their millions. They come to enjoy its natural beauty and the serenity of our pristine environment. But for all the positive things about New Zealand, many feel there is something not quite right about the place. Though intangible, a feeling of unease is never far from our consciousness. It's a feeling that's long been known to stir dark forces within us. Forces that often give rise to unholy acts. Acts that can only be described as evil. Rareka, now peaceful Russell, may have been known as the hellhole of the Pacific, but the South Island had its own satanic settlement that was every bit as rotten. Port Underwood on the Marlborough coast was riddled with rum and syphilis thanks to the whalers who made it their home. Believe it or not, this Arcadian cove was once considered to be the most ungodly place in the colony. Unlike Russell, there was no mission station and no God-fearing pie here across the bay. Port Underwood was settled by the Gard family, headed by the great white whaler, John Gard. He was a fibrous and ferocious fellow and was much feared by Maori. Legend has it that John Gard stood here when Taraupraha landed on the beach with his warriors. He drew a line in the sand and dared the great chief to cross it. But Taraupraha turned and fled like a girl. If only Sir Michael Fay had turned and fled after losing to Dennis Connor and Stars and Stripes in the 1987 America's Cup. Instead, America's Cup fever, a disease which struck at the patriotic and greedy, spread like a sinister spinnaker over New Zealand society during the 80s and 90s. It was the plastic fantastic which first stole the hearts and the minds of the country with its revolutionary fiberglass hull and contagious contemporary chart-topping carol. that fervour and that extraordinary nationalism sort of surged through the country to the deeper south that had nothing to do with yachting and probably never been on a yacht. And we were talking about a sport that I guess is the most elitist, exclusive sport, possibly 98% of the population precluded from ever taking part in it. But we all became part of this very peculiar movement and it was absolute madness and hysteria. But Faye and his crew became dangerously obsessed with their bid to acquire the old mug. They spent millions both on the water and in court. All of it in vain. Many believed the America's Cup to be a rich man's sport. In fact, it was a rich wanker's sport. Their plan now seems to be to set the world up for a lawsuit. I complaining and whimpering about us being unfair or sailing too fast a boat. Nevertheless, in 1995, a group of young Turks led by the godfather of New Zealand yachting, Sir Peter Blake, launched a new campaign. The salty old mariners, Lucky Red Sox, were chosen as the motif for a nationwide fundraising drive. Tragically, the country took to them like tinea to a toe. No matter where you went or what you did today, Everyone was putting their best sock forward. But sadly, 
the red sock was soon to be on the other foot. The socks may have been a national phenomenon in New Zealand, but they were less popular here in Korea. That's because the socks were red with the blood of the Korean sweatshop workers who made them. Workers upon whose exploitation our America's Cup dreams were built. The America's Cup is now New Zealand's Cup. Team New Zealand lifted the cup and brought it home to a rapturous nation. Auckland had not seen such excitement since the Queen Street riots. However, not everyone was cheering. Benjamin Nathan spotted the America's Cup for what it was, a symbol of greed and dominance, and attacked it with a sledgehammer. Sure, when you've bought it, follows you go, oh, you know, like, that's our cup and all that. That's not our cup. That's the rich man's cup. I represent the fucking the true Māori out there who is the poor Māori. Right? That's who I represent, bro. Well, New Zealand's got a real history of just smashing stuff. Like um, Honeheke, when he got angry, what did he do? He go chop down heaps of flagpoles up, up north. I mean, Benjamin was only exercising um, as, a, as right as a Kiwi and as a, as a, um, a part Māori by smashing something else, you know? Greeks do it at the restaurants, smash plates. And uh, yeah, all blacks do it on the field where they smash English rugby players. So I think I think it was brilliant that that, that, that he he brought up to the fore. Come on, we haven't smashed enough. Let's smash some more. Many believed Nathan himself to be evil, but we now know that he was actually doing God's work. Later, God would have the final say. Oh, when the cup was lost. The dream ended, and we had little to show for our national obsession. The race. Further proof of the satanic nature of the America's Cup campaign came from an unlikely source, heavy metal. Some parents now see all heavy metalers as evil. It's been proven that this type of music when played backwards, reveals satanic messages which are designed to poison the minds of the young. Alex Marnie spends much of his time unmasking heavy metal lyrics. Usually it's done by slowing tracks down or playing them backwards. I'm gonna burn your soul. They are heavily into the occult. They heavily follow um, the use of satanic signs, symbols, their music always speaks of Satan and exalts Satan. When the same technology was applied to these words, the America's Cup is now New Zealand's Cup. The results proved truly Zealand's chilling. There's no doubt that bands like Skeldom like to dabble with the devil. In fact, this video for the song Orgiastic Blasphemy was considered so evil. It was banned by the Canadian music broadcasting channel C4. But there's nothing new about this unholy carry-on. 35 years ago, the band Timberjack also struck trouble with the censors, thanks to this evil little ditty. Censorship is nothing new, as this animated film strip illustrates.
because it's an accepted part of life, like parking tickets or lung cancer. But for many years, the very medium which allows you to watch and hear me now as if by some amazing black magic was itself considered evil. Even before Alison Leonard and Audrey began dabbling in the medium, television was thought to be malevolent. Its introduction in the 1960s was greeted with a mixture of fear and derision. If parents are lax in their disciplines as to what their children see and hear, the effect could be bad if they're allowed to sit up late in the evenings and see stuff that's designed for adults, sort of blood and thunder stuff, well, I should think it would have a very bad effect upon them. I very firmly believe that the increase in juvenile delinquency is to a large measure attributable to the television. They can be doing their homework and they can be watching something with one eye on the set and one eye on their homework. When the homework comes to us the next morning, it's all over the page and, oh, well, never mind, I was watching a, an interesting program and I think the teacher will forgive me. or well, maybe the teacher won't forgive me. I watch some TV every night unless I disobey my parents and uh, otherwise I, um, I stay up to um, 9 o'clock and I watch it every night unless I disobey my parents. Neighbourhood theatres felt the immediate impact of television. In five years, more than a hundred have closed. Throughout New Zealand, wherever television has spread, so it has killed the cinema as we used to know it. Though TV doesn't compete, audiences at this Auckland strip club have slumped 50% since 1963. Television, yes, I think it has a terrible impact on the nightlife in Auckland. It had some effect, of course, on visiting. You visit people now and you find them in the middle of a television program and you have to be very tactful, either sit in or go home or go somewhere else. It's impossible to assess fully the impact of programs and their effect on men's minds and behaviour, whether it's turning us and our businessmen into a nation of John Wilders. ...the election of officers for this evening. Um, I notice the time is 9.20 and I would suggest to you that we take a break at this stage to watch the last episode of The Plane Makers. Thank you. Some people consider the New Zealand television archive in Wellington to be something akin to a sewer. But whatever you think of its content, the archive houses some of our most cherished televisual toanga. OK, Heather, let's have a look and see what it is. It's the Pi 26-inch console colour television. <laughs> I'm trying to shock, I was trying to provoke. I was tired. It didn't work. Mr. Pilger, I'm not what, interested in arguing with you. Your questions are so leading. Your book is leading. A rouse erupted between the government and the board of TVNZ. I know, dear, but it helps me keep calm if I can stroke my pussy. <laughs> Law requires that all locally produced programs must be stored here, even the most appalling abominations, so that future generations can learn from the terrible mistakes of our past. This facility, also known as Paenga Mapuna, is one of the most secure in New Zealand, and it has to be. Some of the material stored within these walls is so precious, people will do almost anything to get their hands on it. In 1990, journalist Cameron Bennett tried to break into the facility to remove this embarrassing footage. Bennett filed this story on Arthur Allen Thomas, but in his haste, the lanky reporter forgot to bring his shoes. Apart from the furnishings and a few minor structural changes, it remains essentially as it was, right down to the carpet. After the story went to air, he was teased mercilessly by his peers. After a month of mocking and calls of nice socks groucho, Bennett snapped and tried to break into the archive hoping to find the tape and destroy it. He was foiled by the security system and sustained injuries that could well have killed him or left him with a severe form of undetectable brain damage. Ironically, that footage itself is now in the archive.
Many people believe that the most satanic spectacle to ever screen on our televisions was a show called New Zealand Idol. And although many considered Paul Ellis to be our most evil TV judge, that honour actually belongs to another man altogether. <laughs> Long before Paul Ellis darkened our screens, a man called Phil Warren led a bunch of truly evil judges on a string of talent quests. I think for first comment we should go to Phil. And I really didn't believe it when I heard it. Uh, to me it's an absolute all-time low in everything. The interpretation, the writing, the arrangement, and really the less that I say about it, the better. I am just amazed that out of I don't know how many songs that were submitted for this program, uh, this arrived in the final 30. May it's appalling. Ironically, Phil loved the clearly satanic Hammond family. In the 30 years between New Faces and New Zealand Idol, it seems little has changed, especially our attitudes towards television. I think they leave a lot to be desired. I haven't watched it for the last fortnight. <laughs> the thing that annoys me most it, it actually is the advertising. That would drive you nuts. Much is made of the Maori's prehistory of cannibalism and savagery, and most of it has been negative. But while eating one's own kind was considered evil by the early European settlers, cannibalism in New Zealand was far more cultured than history would have us believe. Two Paiora Ramaki was perhaps New Zealand's first celebrity chef. He was Aotearoa's answer to Jamie Oliver, and like the naked chef, he wore very little. In the late 19th century, he travelled the country promoting his exotic fusion recipes for human flesh, and was popular with furry wives from all tribes. Ramaki was very flamboyant and very popular in both islands. We know from his surviving recipes that he was the first to combine European herbs and spices with traditional Maori ingredients and human meat. Mark Twain was one visitor who sampled Ramaki's delights when he came to New Zealand in 1898. Last night I attended a feast of chiefs and did enjoy a meat of tantalizing tenderness. Flights of herbal fancy disguised its provenance, and only once we had partaken heartily did I learn that we were eating a who and not a what. But sometimes evil meets its match. Indeed, demons were no match for Archdeacon Witty of Christchurch. Well, this occurred many years ago when I was Vicar of Littleton, and I was brought in touch with a woman who, as subsequent events turned out, was indeed possessed by a force of evil. In the name of Jesus Christ, Son of God most, Hi, I command the O evil spirit to depart out of this house and to go to the place that God has appointed for thee in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. More recently, Pastor Rex Meehan took on the duty of fighting Satan despite looking a little like a werewolf. I have come to understand the, some of the ways that Satan is working. We do believe, uh, as the Bible indicates, in the personality of Satan, the being Satan, and uh, we understand that he is the fourth most powerful being in the universe after 
the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And along with Satan, he has a whole army or hordes of evil spirits and demons. Exorcism in New Zealand is practiced largely by the Pentecostal churches, those who speak in tongues. But the established churches are becoming more interested. So Rex Meehan is running classes on exorcism, and included in that group are Presbyterian and Methodist ministers. And impelled this evil spirit to admit and acknowledge that he was a servant of God. And then he said, all right, if I am a servant of God, in the name of Christ, come out. I bind you in the name of Christ. This person has renounced your influence in their life. You no longer have any grounds to remain here. They have rejected you, and I take my stand with them against you. Evil has also manifested itself at Tohoro Beach on the Kapiti Coast in the form of a poltergeist. My eyes were white. They had pupils and you're staring straight in my eyes. Same, same night. Yes, from Thursday night. And you felt like you couldn't move? You just stared at me, you just stared. I can't say no more. Koshla, Koshla. Because you look at this and the next thing I hear is this. A coffee table was disturbed by the poltergeist, or possibly an opossum, but thankfully the velvet tiger, which hangs above the mantle, was left unmolested. There's little doubt that as a nation we're standing on the edge of an abyss of satanic darkness. Whether it be demonic possessions, poltergeists, or the everyday evil of property developers, wickedness lurks at every turn. In this, our Aotearoa, land of evil.